You are listening to episode 1546 of the Permaculture Podcast with Scott Mann, a listener-supported program. As the podcast depends on small, regular contributions from listeners in order to continue and grow, if you enjoy this episode or any of the others in the growing archives, become a member at patreon.com. In exchange, you'll receive early access to episodes, exclusive members-only content, and discounts to vendors, including Chelsea Green Publishing and Field and Forest Products. My guest for this episode is Peter Michael Bauer, who returns today to share with us his thoughts on the distinction between human versus conservation rewilding. Part of that is a critique of what each of these perspectives get right and where they go wrong as we develop the understanding and language to discuss these broad, far-reaching views on how to undo the domestication of people and of the land. During this time, Peter delves into a bit more detail on the nature of rewilding, as well as how people come to this subject through different movements, and explores the process of undomesticating humanity. I also find this to be a compassionate conversation, because it accepts that all of us exist in the modern world, and with that face choices that are influenced by the larger culture we are a part of. As you can imagine from just that introduction of where the conversation will go, there's a lot that we cover, and yet this opening barely scratches the surface of what Peter and I get into today. Before heading into that interview, a few announcements. The first is that in order to make mobile browsing easier, especially through podcast apps like iTunes or Stitcher or Podcast Addict, there is now a resource section in this episode with clear detailed links to all the information and offerings mentioned in the episode, so you don't have to look for inline links to find anything. This will be a regular addition to the show moving forward, and I'll backfill older episodes as time allows. As this show comes out, there are just over three weeks remaining until the drawing for the Permaculture Design course at Joshua Peace Seekers Farm, Verde Energia, in Costa Rica. You can still enter, but the drawing is limited to not more than 50 entries, so get yours in soon. Find the full details by visiting the permaculturepodcast.com and clicking on the Costa Rica tab. I'm also running a listener-only crowdfunding campaign to support a trip to the Possibility Alliance, where Ethan Hughes and I sit down to record tens of hours of audio for the creation of a book that digs deeper into his philosophy and perspective on living intentionally and building community. If you like Ethan's interviews on the show, support this project by going to thepermaculturepodcast.com forward slash book and making a pledge today. Adam Brock, good friend of the show and multi-time guest, is also writing a book, People in Patterns, and the crowdfunding campaign for that ends on Friday, November 6th. Let's push his goal way over the top by supporting this project. You can find out more about what you can expect in that book, and about Adam's broader work on social and economic permaculture by listening to our interview from 2013, Invisible Structures with Adam Brock. If you'd like to get in touch with me and the show, call 717-827-6266 or email show at thepermaculturepodcast.com. Finally, among these announcements, there is a bit of swearing near the end of this conversation, just to let you know in case you listen to this episode at work. Now then, on to Peter Michael Bauer. I'll join you afterwards. Then, Peter, if you'd like to get us started about this idea of human rewilding versus conservation or landscape rewilding, and we can take the conversation from there. The way I kind of grasp or see the merger between these two different things happening, I want to talk about that first before I kind of talk about each thing. It's just that in the definition, rewilding is to undo domestication. So an exploration of that, you know, what does that mean? What does it mean to undo domestication? That to me is the essence of rewilding. From there, it branches out because that's when you have two different perspectives of what it means to be wild. Well, actually, really three different perspectives. You have wild, the idea that it's unmanaged by humans, wild that it's, you know, if you're looking at hunter-gatherers and thinking of them as wild, then you have all these preconceived notions of that, what that means as a member of civilization when you're first beginning to rewild, that you don't really understand how hunter-gatherers actually lived. And then there's wild as it's been redefined through the community of rewilding that's been rewilding for a long time. So there's kind of three sort of branches there, and they all kind of, in the end, I think, will come together. Because I think the further you go down the rabbit hole, the further you get to this idea of how humans are integrated into a landscape and not just like in my mind the the conservation rewilders 
they want to leave wilderness alone. They want to draw a line around a space and they want to just let it go because they think that any human influence is negative overall. Then you have like newbie rewilders per se, who, who still have this idea that hunter gatherers wandered the landscape in search of food or, you know, they, that, that you could just get a bow and arrow and go live in the forest and that's being wild. They haven't done the research yet of how humans integrate into the landscape, how we don't wander the landscape. We have seasonal routes. If we're nomads, we have seasonal routes that we, that we work, seasonal circuits that uh, some people refer to as hoops on the landscape uh, you, where you go from garden to garden. It's not like you're just kind of wandering aimlessly. And I think that's a huge step between understanding that wild in terms of hunter gatherers is managed. Hunter gatherers do manage. So then it becomes a question of, well, what does wild even mean? You know, if you have this idea that wild is un, unmanaged by humans, then how could you consider hunter gatherers wild peoples at the same time? Because if they're managing the landscape, you know what I'm saying? But the thing is, is all wild animals manage the landscape. Manage the landscape. I think we talked about this last time, too, where you have like jays that plant acorns and then years later those acorn trees are feeding the future or those oak trees are feeding the future generations of jays you know there's a a reciprocity that happens there and we consider that a wild relationship so why not consider humans managing the landscape doing the same kinds of things gardening for future generations that's wild too or the term is totally meaningless and we need to come up with something else so getting back into conservation rewilding versus human rewilding and their origins. You know, Dave Foreman, I think he's the one who wrote the first book, really. He, he claims to have coined the term rewilding. And I can't remember the name of his book. Is it Rewilding the World or Rewilding North America? Yes, it was Rewilding North America, a vision for conservation in the 21st century. So you have Dave Foreman, who kind of proposes this idea of giant wildlife corridors. And the idea was to connect vast areas that we already even have established as wildernesses so that the wild animals and all these things are are connected along corridors so they're not islands anymore they're they're part of a a flow system you know across a large scape across the continent really and then you would corral human civilization into these little places picking up on that in the modern era is a lot of europeans and, and i think this has a lot to do with the fact that civilization obliterated indigenous people everywhere around the planet. And there's a couple of things happening here. When that happens, they, first of all, we're not looking at how the indigenous people were managing their landscapes because from the very first aspect of the Bible, we believe that humans were meant to till the soil, you know, Cain and Abel. Cain is an agriculturalist. He was kicked out of the garden we are Cain wandering the planet, right? Living in sin. The idea is we can be saved through Jesus or whatever Messiah so that humans were meant to till the soil. So if civilization came across people who weren't tilling the soil, they thought of them as less than human because from their perspective, that was what humans were meant to do. So if they weren't tilling the soil, it was going to waste basically. So a part of manifest destiny was using this idea that that Native Americans were not managing the landscape the way that humans were meant to, and so it was going to waste. So we needed to take their land in that regard and put it to use for God, which was to farm wheat. You know, so people weren't looking at, you know, they, thought, they saw Native people all over the world burning fields and things like that, but they didn't, like, think about that as land management. So you have that kind of thing already within our cultural minds, mindset, that hunter-gatherers wander the land aimlessly in search of food, not really making any effect on it whatsoever, and not intentionally gardening. Then you have the first conservationists in the United States who were really just adventurers and nature lovers who came to California 10, 15, 20 years after the genocide there, and they're seeing 
tons of wildlife and tons of food for humans. There's elk everywhere. They're huge elk, acorns all over the place. It's just massively abundant. But there's no humans there because the genocide had just happened. But these people are migrating here to this place, and they have no idea that prior to their immigration, the native people were managing the landscape to produce this abundance. So without seeing humans interacting and creating that, the conservationist people get there and they're like, oh, this is the natural state. This is what the wilderness is like without humans. We need to conserve this. And so they create the, the North American conservation movement. So you still, and, and, and it of course goes all over the world. And so now we have this uh, established idea that conservation is removing humans from the equation and letting a place go, quote unquote, wild. There's another element that's coming into play, too, which is through modern anthropology, particularly in the northwest coast or just the west coast in general, from California all the way up to Washington. You have people that are actually listening to Native Americans, people from civilization that are in positions of power through anthropology and things like that, who are actually studying and discussing things with Native people and finding out that they do in fact manage the land and that they have been for thousands and thousands of years. And then you can see that echo across the planet. You can look at these other native people and see how they're managing it. There's a new book came out recently called uh, the largest estate in the world. And it's about Australian Aboriginal land management. And that book echoes some older, not old, but older books, from the mid 2000s uh, about the Northwest coast, which is Indians fire in the land in the North, in the Pacific Northwest, keeping it living and tending the wild by MCAT Anderson. And they all go through heavily how hunter gatherers and horticulturalists manage the landscapes and to what degree, you know, there's a, there's degrees of intensification of food production among all different cultures at, at some point, you have immediate return hunter gatherers, then you have delayed return, then you have, uh, you know, people practicing horticulture and so forth. There's a, a spectrum there. That information is relatively recent. And there's an interesting book out now called Restoring the Pacific Northwest. And on the cover of it is uh, an oak savanna being burned. <laughs> it's funny to just have a, a fire on the cover of a restoration book. But that's because people are understanding, you know, you have this idea of what a pristine wilderness was in the Northwest. Well, that pristine wilderness was managed by humans. So you restore a particular piece of land to what you think is the natural way that it should be here. But you don't include that indigenous human relationship to that land. And within 10, 15 years, it's gone. It's overgrown. There's weeds. There's all kinds of stuff that have come in there. And people are pulling their hair out. They don't understand what's going on. They're like, well, we restored this. This is supposed to be the stable ecosystem. What's missing? They have no idea that the human component was what created that. Now that's changing because of people like Nancy Turner and Doug Doyer and MCAT Anderson, because these anthropologists who have a position of power are communicating with elders from tribes up and down the West Coast and are able to get this information out and now it's spreading. But you still have places in Europe and I think, you know, George Monbiot's book, Feral, who's, which is kind of the European version of Dave Foreman's book. Again, it's, it's this old idea that humans are bad and humans destroy landscapes. And that makes sense for that to be sort of rooted in, in European mythology because they don't have anybody to study over there. The Romans killed every horticulture village that was left, you know. So there's no understanding of how indigenous people of Europe could have managed the landscape in a sustainable way. So that's conservation rewilding. It's missing the human component, which is very, which is severe, I think, to its to its progress in a sense. Whatever I, I hate using the word progress, but to its success. It's missing the human component, aside from also missing um, an articulation of hierarchy. I mean, the idea of, or the power structure, rather, of civilization. I think this idea of shrinking cities to, or, or, or corralling civilization into a, into a little spot while opening up these wildlife corridors would be a great transition 
to another way of life. But it, unfortunately, it completely ignores the economic basis of civilization, which is continuous growth. And there are mechanisms in place that will stop that from happening, stops anything like letting wilderness areas go from happening. I mean, it makes me think of like um, the first time I peed in one of those urinals that's a non-flushing urinal. And it says, Congratula you know, there's a little plaque above it on the wall. I'm peeing and I can read it. <laughs> I'm reading the plaque. And it says, congratulations, you just conserved, by using this urinal, you're helping to conserve 40,000 gallons of water per year or something like that. And my mind, <laughs> I just thought immediately, you mean I'm giving $40,000 to a corporation instead. This idea of conservation is great, but what it's really doing is just putting things aside for whenever corporations and the government want to take them. At the end of the day, they're going to take them. And that's what we see over and over again. I mean, if you look at national forests, those are supposed to be protected public lands, but they're treated like a, a Douglas fir monocrop here in the Northwest. I would have to dig it up, but I believe there's a reference that I have in one of my textbooks about how that land was put aside for the good of the American people. And as time has changed, what that good means has as well to the point that we reach this space of extraction because then that becomes products for the American consumer. And with what you laid out, it makes me think that the forces that would have to change in order to allow for that space of wilderness and for human beings to move into cities and to conserve that area in some form, right now as things exist that would only occur if it benefited those who would be extracting those resources later to sell back to us exactly you have another conundrum there too with cording off wildlife areas is indigenous lands rights issues if we were to shrink civilization into into these corrals and leave open these wildlife corridors that are unpeopled what about the indigenous people who are from those places. What about their rights as far as resource management and things like that? I mean, that that's a huge issue that I think, again, the erasure of native peoples is something that's unquestioned or unnoticed as far as conservation rewilding goes. Again, that's not really an issue in, in Europe because people don't have that lineage anymore. They've lost it for the most part as far as indigenous land management practices that are, you know, regenerative, not just farming claims as far as their heritage goes. But in North America, Australia, anywhere else in the world, really, I think all of that stuff is still going on. Which makes me consider many of the tribes that have been moved to reservations in the West originally came from the East and were pushed right. further and further away from those ancestral lands or like the First Nations people in Canada from some figures that I heard recently, they're the most imprisoned portion of the Canadian population. So they've also been removed from the land, but rather than pushed to particular spaces, being pushed into prisons. That's crazy. The way that that disconnects then from the cultures that are required in order to remove to those lands to have the stories and the wisdom of the people who came before us. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to talk some trash on, hu on human <laughs> rewilding, which is what I do. Not trash, but to just talk about the, the problematic parts of rewilding with humans. So, Before you get too far into that, there was one thing that you said earlier that I wanted to touch back on, was that about rewilding is to undo domestication. And I was wondering how you would see people being able to undomesticate themselves, what that process would involve, and how that impacts where you're going to go about kind of talking trash on the people rewilding side of things. Because in reading some of the material that I've seen from the rewild.com Facebook page and some other places, there does seem to be a disconnect from moving towards that undomestication as a person and what that means, as well as then the human rewilding process and how in some ways that's also being adopted without giving respect to those who came before who share those lessons. 
Yeah, well, this, this, so I'll go on the journey. <laughs> I'll start okay. at the beginning. So there's been a, a push to connect with nature for a long time. You know, I mean, it's when I was a teenager, I got into Tom Brown Jr.'s books. He's a survival teacher, has a lot of what he would call Native American folklore. Probably I wouldn't refer to it in that way, but it got me inspired to think about what it means to live an indigenous life way. And so I started to study that for myself through anthropology mostly, and later through studying with different native people and later through researching my own ancestry through archeology span in Europe. But prior to that, you just have this idea of wanting to be a hunter gatherer. I mean, the main thing, the main, my main impulse for it was collapse. Like a lot of people come to rewilding for many different reasons, but for me, it was collapse. I read Ishmael by Daniel Quinn and I was like, civilization is going to collapse tomorrow. I got to learn how to survive in the woods. From there, it became eventual, an, an eventual, just a lifestyle of learning these skills because you realize you can't learn them right away. And survival is not the same thing as ancestral life ways. And, you know, there's just it's a lot more complex than I had given thought. Eventually, I came to anarcho-primitivism through uh, the Green Anarchy magazine and realized that I aligned with those ideas more than anything. I hadn't, there hadn't really been a word for, I guess, my political belief system, although I hate to label myself as anything. So I never really, even though anarcho-primitivism, you could, somebody would easily hear me describing what I believe in and decide to label me that. I just hated the label, so I never used it. What I did like, though, was the word rewilding, which came out of anarcho-primitivism as far as humans undoing their domestication. Um, anarcho-primitivism is basically anarchist primitivism. <laughs> it's the idea that indigenous or primitive, quote-unquote primitive people, although we don't use that word anymore, another reason why I don't like the term anarcho-primitivism is because primitive is used as a pejorative to indigenous people. So you know, language is a hard thing to try <laughs> to try to work through and come up with a word that really means what you want it to. It's very difficult when it's a concept that's outside of what the language is able to do or what your worldview is able to see. So anyway, the idea of anarcho-primitivism is that primitive peoples lived in anarchist societies, and that's the ideal anarchist society. That's my summation of it. I'm sure there's lots of anarcho-primitivists who would be upset with how I'm describing it. But, you know, basically, rewilding is, in my mind, doing anarcho-primitivism. If you have a critique of civilization and you want to do something about it, you rewild. If you want to work toward living in a tribe, quote unquote, or a culture of people that are living from the land regeneratively, ancestrally in a pre-Iron Age or pre-Metal Age kind of way, pre-agricultural, then that's rewilding because agriculture is the begin. Agriculture and pastoralism merged to become like sort of the essence of domestication So, and civilization later. Anyway, so rewilding, I found it on the anarcho-primitivist website, Green Anarchy dot info and the word really grabbed me and it described everything i was doing and everything i believed so at the time nobody else was really talking about doing the rewilding stuff on the internet you know you had the wild roots collective people were put out a zine called uh rewild i want to say resist but it's not resisted it was like Reclaim Rewild. It was a zine called Reclaim Rewild. And you had Kevin Tucker and John Zerzan and lots of other people, Red Wolf Returns, you know, these writing for Green Anarchy magazine about rewilding. But Green Anarchy was a printed thing. It wasn't on the internet. And I love the magazine for the content, but I just, I, I didn't really like the aesthetic of it, to be honest. So I created rewild.info because to me, that was right when I was interacting with people most on the internet. And, you know, a magazine is great, but what do you do when you want to talk to people about these ideas and you don't have anywhere in your local community to talk about them? So I created rewild.info, which is now rewild.com. 
and started blogging under the moniker Urban Scout about rewilding and quickly learned that I needed to talk about the philosophy of it and delve into that in order to basically persuasive essays to convince more people to come to rewilding or for more people to realize if they were already rewilding to come and join us and have these conversations. It was during this time that, that we, you know, found all these books, Tending the Wild uh, by M. Cat Anderson, Keeping It Living by Doug Doyer and Nancy Turner, and realized that, the, that there is no such thing as a hunter-gatherer, that that's just a myth. And that humans manage the landscape, which at the same time you're thinking, okay, you know, well, we've been using this word rewilding for a long time now, but it doesn't really educate people on what it actually means to rewild because the idea of wild and domestic is kind of being shattered if you look at how people have always managed the landscape. So really what it comes down to is that domestication is is about control and about eliminating variables in that control so much so that humans are the sole thing tending a particular crop whether it be animal or plant or whatever you know you you've got this the essence of control so the idea of rewilding with humans was to return to a hunter gatherer way of life but then if you're like oh there's no such thing as a hunter gatherer then what does it mean it becomes really really hard to talk about and really hard to to teach people what it means especially when you have a word that like wild that also is a synonym for crazy you know it, it's a synonym for free like because wild actually means free willed wild is willed as in free will self willed but that's considered crazy if you're trying to control something you don't want it to have its own will so that's the difference between domestication and wild really but how many people who get into rewilding initially know that not a lot of people so this is where you have like the human rewilding split kind of happens this way but it's not really a split where people diverge paths it's more of a an influx you have people coming into rewilding from two different directions really and one is this paleo lifestyle expansion because Paleo diet is, you know, the idea that our ancestors had a better diet than we have today, which is undeniably true, archaeologically, anthropologically, everything. Defining the paleo diet is pointless because every human culture had a different diet all over the planet. So you can't say the paleo diet has no grains because that doesn't make any sense. There are paleo diets with grains, for example, or people who are on the paleo diet eat too much meat. Well, in some regions, people ate a ton of meat. And in some places, way less meat. So there's no one paleo diet, right? But the idea being that it was a healthier way of life for the individual as far as diet is concerned. So you have kind of an individual pursuit in the paleo lifestyle of, you know, there's a lot of talk of like maximizing human potential and things like that. It kind of make me want to vomit a little bit because I just think that that's some sort of weird neo-eugenics perspective. I, I think it's really weird to look at human perfection. Again, maybe they're looking at it in a different way. Maybe they're looking at it as, a, uh, I don't know, but whenever I hear words like purity or perfection or potential, I, it just kind of makes me feel gross because I think everybody is different. And I think everybody's perception of those things is very different as well. And there's so many different ways of doing things. So, you know, again, there is no one pure paleo diet, right? So the idea of purity is ridiculous. It's like finding whatever works good for your body is the ideal thing to do. So I don't want to make it sound like everybody who's coming into it through the paleo diet is like self-absorbed. I came in, <laughs> I came into it too because I had a health, health issues, you know? So you have health issues. Obviously, you have to take care of yourself. You learn about the paleo diet. It makes sense. You start doing it. Maybe you feel better. Maybe you don't. Maybe you do something else instead. But if the paleo diet really does make you feel good and you understand the principles, then you can take it a step further. It's going to open up this rabbit hole. Well, what else is there? You know, what else am I doing? So it's, it becomes this paleo lifestyle, right? Where you have 
Mark Sisson of the Primal Blueprint, you have his Primal Fitness Plan and you have the MoveNat thing. So it's all about now Now it's gone into fitness and movement and these other things that are important for physical well-being and walking, you know, with a fox walk or, man, it would be better if we had, you know, we evolved without shoes. So it makes sense that we should go barefoot, but we can't go barefoot in modern times. So what if we invented barefoot shoes, you know? <laughs> Which is an oxymoron, barefoot shoes. That's an oxymoron. You can't do that. So then, you know, you, if you follow that down the rabbit hole and you keep going, well, what about my relationships with people? What about where I get my food? Maybe I should start foraging for wild food. And then you have people foraging for wild food. And that's when they can eventually match up with people who've been doing it for a lot longer. But it's just frustrating because I think everybody has to go through that process in a way any which way you come from rewilding you're going to go down the rabbit hole and you're going to meet each other down there if you keep going but it seems like there's a, a push for people to just like get their 10 minutes a day in nature so that they feel better rather than trying to undo domestication to the fullest extent possible they're doing this idea of hacking their life which is like circumventing having to attack a root cause of something and getting a result without actually changing anything at all. I can wear barefoot shoes and then it's like I'm a hunter gatherer instead of trying to dismantle the culture that created shoes to begin with or whatever, you know, or create a culture that doesn't need shoes at all. It's weird to to even consider it a radical element of rewilding because it is rewilding. Rewilding is the radical philosophy of abandoning civilization and undoing domestication to the fullest extent possible. With what you laid out there, as I turn it over in my own mind, that many of these entry points into these various things, whether it's rewilding or something else that takes us closer to nature, that it becomes a matter of buying products and continuing to consume and still being a part of the dominant culture and doing things that make us feel better rather than really doing the things that we need to make a real transition. Absolutely. Yes. Al Gore's movie on climate change was revolutionary in that it just educated so many people about the problems. But then at the very end, what's his solution? Well, we just all need to change the light bulbs in our house. I was furious at the end of that movie for that reason. And I get furious when I see people doing that with rewilding of course that's kind of the inevitability of a subculture is once it reaches some sort of critical mass is when it you know oh somebody's going to figure out how to make money doing it and the way they're going to make money doing it is making it broadly appealing and consumer based that's just the, an inevitability of anything really the question is Will that growth help or hinder the actual revolution? And I hate using the word revolution, but in my mind, rewilding is a, is a revolution. It's a transformation of power because we're walking away from civilization. We're saying no. So here's where I want to get into the divisions of people that are rewilding and sort of the idea of... Uh, of the social economic network of the rewilding movement as opposed to radicals and non-radicals in rewilding. I think every little push to get further into that way of life or, or to keep it there is a benefit. Everyone has limits to the extremes they're willing to go to get the way of life that we know we need. And I mean that in the sense that, you know, we're all captives, to use Daniel Quinn's language. We're all captives of this story. And we have another story to live in now. Rewilding is another story. But we can see that there's another story, but that doesn't mean we have the ability to walk over and be part of it without having to sacrifice a lot of, of our own comforts within civilization. So I think everybody has a level of what they're able to do and what they're passionate about, really. So you have people who are like sitting in trees, for example, political activism that are preventing forests from being cut down. That's rewilding. 
Uh, you have people planting out native plant gardens in their backyard. That's rewilding. You have, you know, a person just doing paleo diet, wearing barefoot shoes. I don't know if that's rewilding. <laughs> they might be re rewilding their body, but they're not rewilding anything else. And to me, rewilding, first and foremost, means living a life in service to the land and community around you. So if that's not part of it, then it's not rewilding really to me. Because it's a cultural transformation. It's not an individual transformation. There's an individual transformation that happens when you become part of the culture of rewilding. And that's the part that is sellable. And that's the part that's being extracted and sold. Okay. And that's what's frustrating, you know, is, is the same thing. It's like, well, yeah, you can do things that are going to make you feel more wild, but that's not going to actually change the culture. But everybody has like their limits of what they're able to do. I'm not going to go sit in a tree. You know, I'm not passionate about that. I don't want to get arrested. I fully support the people who do that. And I think they're brave and courageous warriors. And I wish I had the guts to do something like that. I don't. So instead, I'm going to do whatever I can, which is to educate people on ancestral life ways through my nonprofit, Rewild Portland. You know, I'm going to keep getting the ideas out there that we need to do different things, change the way we're living, and try to create that as much as I can working within the system. I'm not one of the people who is going to go live on the hoop with Phoenicia Madrano and basically live on the edge of the law. I'm afraid. I have health issues that prevent me. But I honor them, and I send people their way all the time. And the goal is to create those kinds of life ways, you know, to recreate them or to find them here. Of course, there's something that's also very problematic in human rewilding, which is in North America, at least, which is that you've got native populations fighting the government for their property, for their land rights on the front lines of a genocide. And then on the other end, you have white privileged people dressing up in buckskins and going and foraging and hunting and gathering and getting on TV for it and being, being like honored in a way or, or, you know, sold to the American public as a cool edgy thing, which is a massive problem. And, and I think that the problem is solved by recognizing that as rewilders, we have to ally with indigenous populations in their struggle for their land rights and their cultural traditions and to be non-culturally appropriative and respectful. And I don't really see that happening in the bigger, I see it happening all over the place because I, most of the rewilders that I know aren't on TV and they're engaged with native allyship work. But when I see people, you know, famous people getting famous on rewilding and they're white men and they're not saying anything. In fact, sometimes they say racist things that further continue the erasure of native people like we can't learn anything from them. They don't know anything anymore. Their cultures were destroyed. Those kinds of myths. It just makes it out to be a really disgusting movement of white privilege instead of a collaborative journey back to an ancestral life way in which we can all help each other. So that's a huge problem with the human rewilding is not recognizing white privilege, I think, and continuing this erasure of native people, which the conservation rewilders do also. Then it becomes one of science and what this culture has learned is the, what will provide the right way to rewild the landscape rather than turning to those indigenous peoples who managed the landscape for thousands of years long before this. Exactly. And that's not to say, I mean, there's an idea of like romanticizing indigenous people too. And that's not what I'm talking about either. There are cultures who all over the world that accidentally destroyed their landscape, you know, but those aren't the ones that live in the long run. And I think everybody has that 
you know, every culture has that. But we can look at the cultures that have survived in North America for 20,000 years and recognize that the ones that are thriving, first of all, they just have a right to be here and a right to their lands without any of this. Secondly, we can look at their their land management practices and recognize that those are a much more sustainable way of doing things here. With those ideas in mind, one of the upcoming issues of Permaculture Design Magazine is about decolonizing permaculture. And that's a term that I've encountered frequently, but it's not something that I've explored. Is that something that you could speak to, this idea of decolonization and how we might be able to decolonize some of these movements and the things that we're involved in? You know, the interesting thing about the word colonize is that it comes from colere, which is a Roman word that means to till the soil. It's interesting that it be, has become to mean some, some other things, you know, decolonization in particular from my own examination of it. It's like rewilding in that there's a spectrum of the conversation, it, which makes it difficult for me to grasp how to move forward in it because you have an extreme end of decolonization, which is people saying anybody who doesn't have Native American ancestry needs to get the fuck out. And then you have, there's another element that's like, hey, if you do what we say, then you can stay here and be an ally. And then there's the far end, which is just like, it's a metaphor for removing the ideas of colonization from our minds and working together. So I've had a difficult time kind of figuring out where I land in that and how to integrate rewilding if that's, if there is an integration that can happen there. At the end of the day, from what I've read from decolonization, it's not about ending state power. It's about putting state power in the hands of native people people with native ancestry from where I stand as a rewilder. I think that we, you know, as an anarchist, I think that that state governments are not an ideal way of humans to live. And I think that not going that far is detrimental and from some of what I've read about decolonization, there is things that say we don't, we're not nostalgic for the way our people used to live. We want our own, right? We, we want to be able to control our own lands, which makes perfect sense. And I don't argue with that at all, of course. From an anti-civilization perspective, it doesn't seem to quite match up with wanting to dismantle civilization entirely and to create hunter gatherer bands or recreate or integrate into them. As it stands, much of the conversation still continues to perpetuate the system that currently exists. It just moves power. I think it's partly that, but I think it's also, I think they look at power differently than civilization. And I think that part of decolonization is looking at that power differently but like I said, I don't really from there's so much that I've read that is not necessarily contradictory, but that's there's a diversity of what that word means in the same way that there does, there's a diversity of what rewilding means. So it's been difficult for me to to plug into that. I think it's the sort of the latest buzzword for people who are looking to ally with native people. I think that they want to learn what this means. That's why I did it. So I'm not surprised that there's going to be a permaculture issue about it. I'm very interested to read it because, like I said, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it myself. Another reminder that we only have so much time and so much ability to explore these ideas. And we all <laughs> ultimately, as generalist as we may be in some things, there are niches that we can only explore so far. Exactly. Yeah. It is an interesting rabbit hole, though, this 
intersection between permaculture and rewilding for me and this idea of kind of continuing on my personal path to stand in two worlds with every exploration that I do, that there's this acculturation that I've been a part of that I know that I'm not capable of leaving, uh, similar to what you were sharing with us about not being someone to sit in trees or to go and live on that edge of the law on a hoop, but to encourage people to explore those ideas. I know that I'm not capable of many of the things that you and many of the others who I've come to know in the rewilding community are doing, and that it is a personal path for each of us as we do this. And for me, my hope is still in the multi-generational approach that as we can educate more people and children and grandchildren from our generation, that those who we will never meet will be best served by what it is that we're doing now. Right. Well, and there's also, there are barriers in place right now that won't be in place in 10 years, that won't be in place in 25 years. You know, uh, as empire collapses, those barriers go away. Barriers can be laws, they can be personal Barriers, you know, you have a job that you're getting money and buying food at the grocery store. Well, what happens when the economy collapses? You will be gardening. And it's not a choice at that point. You know what I mean? I think that a lot of our choices will be forced upon us. And I think that's just a natural thing. I think people don't really do a lot until there's a massive environmental reason or cultural reason, which they usually go together to do those things. If there was no choice, I would join the hoop. Because, duh, that's where the food is. So, I don't know. I mean... It's something that Jason Gadeski said to me after our interview while we were kind of hanging out at this one event that we were both attending. And we were discussing, for me, I was looking at it because of kind of the role that I've come to inhabit And as a result of that, I've come to have kind of a focus on the personal responsibility aspect of things, which then turned into Jason countering, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, so I'm just going to paraphrase as best as my memory allows, was about how, similar to what you were saying, we're caught within this system, and that the space that we're in is systemic, that limits the choices and options that we have. So is it all a matter of personal responsibility with what we're doing? Or is it that we're in a place that we can accept the system that we're in and the pieces of it that we can't change while still kind of blending that idea of personal responsibility without it being a smokescreen for these other things to start pushing those boundaries for ourselves and others? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a combination of both. For me, in my mindset, too often it becomes that binary of one or the other. Right. And it takes conversations like the one that we've had today to provide the opening for me to step back and see both worlds and how they come together in certain places and where those leverage points are to create the greatest amount of change. Absolutely. It makes me think of, you know, I've got my Rewild or Die, the book that I wrote as Urban Scout. I'm I'm putting it back out at the end of the month. And uh, it makes me think of that because... Guy McPherson wrote a review of the book at, per my request, and the review was basically a very scathing review of the book, and, and, and I, which I told him to post. He actually sent me sent it to me beforehand, and said, "Do you really want me to post this?" And I said, "Yes, of course." Like you know, uh, and he didn't understand. And it's it's funny that that interaction happened because part of his review was just. He couldn't understand the, the, the number of contradictions that I had in the book. And I feel like we just live contradictions in our lives. And if you can see things three-dimensionally, they're not necessarily contradictions. And, but if you can only see things in black and white, then of course you're not going to understand how you can hold two opposing worldviews in your mind at the same time. And so, of course, when I, I sent him, he sent me an email saying, oh, do you really want me to post this? And I said, yes, of course, it's awesome. And then I wrote a response blog talking trash about his, his review. He didn't understand, which I later deleted, but, you know, <laughs> he didn't understand that I could both see his scathing review as awesome and have a lot to say about it in response, negative 
you can have both. I think there's this weird thing that's that polarizes people into political parties, into whatever, you know, instead of being able to hold multiple things at once and just discern which one is the most important at any given moment is really important. And I don't know if that's something that people just don't have anymore or because it seems that way with politics, you know, I mean, it seems that way with people want to believe in one thing. Maybe that's just how humans are in general. Um, I, I don't know. But the, the idea of fundamentalism, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Like, like you can't believe multiple things at once. It makes me think of, uh, well, it makes me think of the, the verb to be, which I wrote about in, in this chapter, English versus rewilding, where you have the verb to be, the is of identity, according to Aristotle, is that, you know, something is something, but it can't be two things at once. So you're either an asshole or you're a nice guy. You can't be both at the same time because that doesn't make sense. The is of identity is God in a sense. It, it, it puts things in these static shapes. And these scientists figured this out in the early 1900s and they were because they were viewing a, an electron through different instruments. And through one instrument, it was a wave. And through another instrument, it was a particle. But something can't be both a particle and a wave. It just was scientifically impossible in, in their minds at the time. And so they realized that they couldn't say this is a wave if it was also a particle. So they came up with this they came up with this thing called E prime, which is English without the verb to be. The idea was it was a more accurate representation of reality because the is of identity is a false representation of reality. It puts things in a fixed state, but nothing is ever in a fixed state. A tree becomes a table, a table becomes firewood etc. A, a person can act like an asshole. They can also later act like a nice person, but they are not, they are not either one of those things necessarily. And so they came up with this idea of E prime, which I actually wrote my book in E prime. So there's no verb to be, be, is, was, am, are, were, nothing in the whole book. And I, I learned this from my friend Willem, who's super into it. He still writes in E prime. But it, this idea of something having to be one way or the other, I think, is central to a civiliz civilized way of looking at things. I don't think you can really have those same conversations in languages that don't have the verb to be. And most languages don't have a verb to be unless they're Latin based. Which is just interesting in and of, in and of itself. You know, it makes me think of German where you don't say I am hungry. You say I have hunger. Anyway, that's going off on a whole other tangent. No, that's okay. It's my exploration of language has been Latin, French, Spanish, English. So thinking of, of language without to be is a little hard yeah. for me to wrap my head around, but it sounds like I'll have to do some additional reading. But what you touch on there, that idea of being an asshole, but also being a nice guy reminds me of what we were talking about before we really started recording about you know, the justice system and judicial actions and how on an interview that I did on restorative justice, that conversation touched on the idea that we are more than the worst decision we've ever made, but it sometimes is hard for that understanding to be made. Mm. And especially in, you know, the justice system where you're being tried for a particular crime and that you know, at least from the police procedurals and everything else that I've ever seen from like from American pop culture is that it focuses on that action more so than anything else. Totally. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I like that phrase that you said. We're more than we are more than the worst decision we've ever made. Yeah, that's great. What you were saying about fundamentalism, there was a conversation that I had with a minister many years ago because I was trying to wrap my head around some things because of the background that I came from regarding my, my family's faith tradition and how certain passages of the Bible were used to justify certain actions. And yet in that same chapter, particularly Leviticus comes to mind for this, you know, very often in that same chapter, that same book can be another 
rule or law about something can speak to with a certain moral authority, and yet the people who are using passage A to condemn something then ignore passage B. Right. And it was interesting for me to have this conversation with the minister because he was talking about how very often these fundamentalist ideas arise because there's something for us to hold on to, because they provide security within the world and the place that we live in, that holding on to these handful of ideas and using them to bolster a position or denigrate others, whether that's faith or anything else, allows us an opportunity to not have to think about those things or to have to face these ideas that are very scary because of how they conflict with our worldview that to try to hold a counter idea within our mind can provide a crisis of identity. Right. And so that it's better to hold on to that than to face that. Interesting. Yeah. You know, having this conversation with a minister was very dynamic for him to be the one laying out these mm. kinds of ideas and discussing zealotry within faith traditions and how, and how a good leader who comes from a faith tradition that talks about acceptance and love, the need for them then to foster those people who follow them to be that shepherd leading their flock and to show other ways. And I just tried to condense a, about a two hour long conversation <laughs> into a couple of little God, sound bites awesome. and just how it requires a certain, I don't like necessarily this term, but it requires a certain strength within someone's beliefs as well as a certain like emotional maturity in order to face those things totally. in wanting to do those, to be able to do so in a safe space where again, so often we don't have, we could get into a long conversation <laughs> about, you know, the, the denigration of self and the removal of personal identity within culture because of acculturation and how, you know, the construct of how we think of ourselves with ego and, you know, our nature versus our demeanor are these things that arise from the stories that are told to us and the stories that we talk about ourselves. But <laughs> <laughs> I've already had you here for a while and that's probably we'll come back and have another conversation about myth and storytelling. But before we bring this to a close, Peter, do you have any final thoughts for the listeners? Uh, I guess my final thought is that the more people that rewild, the more people are going to bring all those avenues together. And I think that the conservation rewilding, as much as I, I, you know, am critiquing aspects of it, I still respect it. And I think that at the end of the day is going to come down the rabbit hole and meet the human land management side of it. And at the same time, I think that the, the human rewilding component, if drawn out and if gone down the rabbit hole, is going to figure out better ways of integrating people into those same ideas as well and also allying with native people too it might sound like i'm complaining or something but i'm actually just working myself through these ideas as i work on them so hopefully sharing it will then encourage more people to have these conversations so that we can all get to the same page that's my final thought well thank you peter for being a part of this conversation and sharing that with me because I find that it's in the dialogue and in the discussion and being able to air these ideas that we are able to come to an even better understanding of it. And I know that from what we spoke about today and what you shared, I have a much better understanding of rewilding, not only of the person, but also the landscape and how that intersects with permaculture. So thank you for being a part of my personal education and rewilding process. Thank you. And that was Peter Michael Bauer. You can find more of his work at rewild.com and the Rewild Facebook group. The nonprofit that he mentioned during the interview, Rewild Portland, is at rewildportland.com, which is also where I found the cover picture for this episode. I entered this conversation with only a cursory knowledge of conservation rewilding, and in speaking with Peter, it reinforced a simple point that is made self-evident with permaculture. People are a part of the world and the environment, and as a result of that, all the systems that we design. As permaculture practitioners, even though our end goal may be to design ourselves out of a project, the act of design is a human practice. So is reintroducing wolves to the American Midwest. Yes, they were once native there, and we removed them, but we also changed the habitat they are returning to. The place they came from historically will never be there again. 
regardless of what we might project onto the landscape through our vision and actions. This kind of influence is not limited to the modern era. We have an anthropological and historical record that stretches back for tens of thousands of years that shows that humanity modified the environment for our use. We are social animals and tool makers with big brains and intelligence that allows us to change the world. I don't see a reason why we shouldn't do so, but that we have to guide, but we have to guide what we do to ensure that it benefits all life. And because I believe that you can't take care of something else without taking care of yourself, that we have to start with our own life. We can do that not only with permaculture, but also more individually by undomesticating ourselves and rewilding ourselves to begin questioning the cultural stories we hear, including the news and the beliefs that we grew up with. Look at how those narratives serve the hierarchies that seek to keep us tame and the structures in place that disconnect us from the people and resources that we need, including that connection to place. As we work through that to reconnect with the land, even if the only place that we can go is the heavily modified city environment where we find ourselves, we can see what lives there, what grows there, get to know the names of the plants, animals, and fungi so that we can learn more about them, including the yields useful to our systems and other life, but at the same time remembering that the name given is not the subject being named, and there is more to a single plant or animal than we can fully hold in our thoughts. Through this exploration and understanding, begin to tend that space if you're not already, or find ways that you can tend to it further than you are now, so that it cares for the life that inhabits the area, and so that you care for that life. As you tend to the land and to yourself, bring more people in, your family, your friends, your neighbors. Share food and create new stories together. Take actions in the ways you are able, but put yourself out there. Do something that feels different or a little uncomfortable. Make some noise. Show others what you can do and be an inspiration for them of what they are capable of. And begin the cycle anew. Help them so that they contend for their well-being and for the land. Just as we are more than the worst decisions we have ever made, we are also more than the worst decisions our culture ever made. Let's go make some better choices and take care of Earth, ourselves, and each other.